As uh, Justice Stiegel, or as we like to call him, Caleb, uh, just said, sometimes presentations on case law updates can be somewhat boring. And so if you do doze off, that's appropriate. Just don't snore during those presentations. What we decided to do, because you do, hopefully, does everybody have the written materials that we had outside? Each of you practice in various areas. Some of you may be in, in governmental uh, practice. Some may be in civil practice. Some may be in criminal. Uh, we have uh, those who are in, in lobbyists, uh, members of the public. Uh, you may be interested in different things. So what we thought we would do, instead of going through a, a bunch of cases, we want to highlight a few things, and in particular, we want to highlight kind of things relating to judicial philosophy. And so the first case we're going to talk about, which is on page 8 of your uh, outline, is uh, one you probably uh, have read about. Uh, it was a pretty big uh, topic in the retention elections uh, in November, which is the Hobbs and Nasser case, uh, which involved the Kansas Unborn Child Protection from Dismemberment Abortion Act. Uh, and if you notice, Justice Stiegel has left the room because this case is currently under review by the Kansas Supreme Court. But I think it's very important for us to talk about this case, and it's one that uh, both Tony and I will talk about a little bit and offer some commentary, because I think this case probably does more than any other case that I know in, in recent history in Kansas to show kind of the differences in judicial philosophy. Uh, not necessarily differences in political philosophy, because as I'll point out, uh, at least those who agree with just, uh, Judge Powell and I, uh, we had uh, Democrats, Republicans, an independent uh, geographical diversity, the only African American judge, uh, male, female, so there was diversity, but, but where there was uh, things that in common involved judicial philosophy and different approaches that uh, the judges to, I thought maybe, uh, Tony, you want to just tell kind of the history of how it came to pass that we had to uh, even review this case. Well, it's funny, when I, I think of my career in politics, and when I was in the House, I was an outspoken pro-life advocate, but when I came to the judiciary, I was determined to put my political views aside and decide cases uh, as to the law, and of course in Central County, we elect our uh, district judges down there, and Kansans for Life and other groups are involved in those races to a certain extent. Uh, I know Kansans for Life endorses uh, judicial candidates, and I also often thought, you know, when I became a district judge and being a state court judge, I really never thought that I would actually have the opportunity to actually rule on, a, on an abortion question. I always thought that there was a little bit more heat than light uh, on that issue, particularly as it related to the state judiciary. Uh, but what's interesting that in my career I actually have encountered the question twice. Uh, there was a case in Cedric County, I don't know if it ever made the papers in Northeast, I think it did. Uh, there was a trial of Dr. Tiller. Uh, I don't know if you recall that he was charged with some 14 misdemeanor counts. Uh, criminal counts of, of violating, I think, the disclosure uh, laws and uh, uh, abuse of a child for not re certain reporting those issues. And uh, I was assigned that case by the uh, criminal presiding judge who at the time was uh, Judge Waller. And of course, uh, that in itself became uh, news. The, the Associated Press report, I was appointed on a I think on a Thursday, and we had a brief hearing on Friday, and then on Saturday, there was a big article in the paper, and I think it may have been statewide because it was done by John Hanna and the Associated Press, talking about comments that I had made about uh, Dr. Tiller when I was a member of the legislature. And I were actually- were text. No. Good. Um, and, and what's funny is I, I didn't recall those comments at all, but uh, I, I remember in my ruling, recusing myself of the case, which I ultimately did, um, saying that I didn't deny having made them. But I made the point that regardless of what your views on abortion may be, that isn't the cause or the reason you should recuse yourself from a case that might implicate abortion. 
In, in my particular instance, I felt that it created a problem in the minds of a reasonable person. Uh, I, of course, felt I could be fair to Dr. Tiller, but given my comments that I had made, I thought in the minds of a reasonable person, it would cause someone to question my impartiality, and so I recused from, myself from that case. He ultimately, uh, was, the case was reassigned to a different judge. I think Dr. Tiller was acquitted uh, of those charges. Uh, and that occurred, I want to say that was about 10 years ago, I think that case happened. Uh, and then this case, um, what's interesting about how this case came to our court and in its posture before the Supreme Court currently, it's just, um, I think it's a motion to uh, dismiss. Uh, it's a, a pro, no, excuse me, on a preliminary injunction stage, which is very unusual, it's really unusual to see a case go all the way through the appellate process just at a, such a very preliminary uh, stage. And we were surprised uh, to actually end up having to decide the question because both parties asked the Supreme Court to transfer the case to itself and decide this issue because we all recognize what a significant issue it was and that question that's before the court is on the strictly narrow grounds of whether the Kansas Constitution uh, recognizes a right to abortion. The, the litigants deliberately did not plead any federal question uh, in the case, which makes it very unusual. I suspect that there's, there's some strategy behind that, but it's significant for that reason and that all the cases that you see about abortion, they're all pleading federal uh, question uh, type issues in those cases. This one is unique in that it's really the first case to really address the question of abortion. Uh, the other significant thing, and I don't know, Dave, you're going to get maybe more into the, the guts of the case, but uh, it was the first time that our court had sat on a bonk in, I think, 20 years or so. Um, our court is made up, as you know, of 14 judges. We typically sit in panels of three, and we hear cases all over the state. Uh, only very rarely do we sit as a group of, of 14. Uh, in fact, the last time the court had done so, like I say, was about 20 years ago. Uh, the most, I think the only other published case was a case back, I think in the late 70s, dealing with the Public Employee Relations Act which the court heard and, and sat in a box. So was, in terms of historical significance for the court, uh, it was very historical. It was, it was interesting because with 14 of us, there was only one courtroom that we could use that would be able to have to seat all of us, and that was the Supreme Court uh, chambers. And so we used the Supreme Court chambers, basically doubled up. As you know, there's some, seven members of the Kansas Supreme Court, so there were 14 of us sitting around the dais and it just fit uh, all 14 of us. In fact, if we ever get a 15th or a 16th judge, we're gonna have to find someplace else because even that uh, won't be big enough. Uh, and so it was very interesting, uh, I think, from a historical perspective on that point. The other thing that I think is significant is it's the first time that our court has ever been evenly divided, which is also a rarity uh, in judicial circles. You don't see divided uh, courts very often. Uh, that was also, I think, historically significant. Uh, and as Judge Brunt said, what was also interesting was the makeup. Uh, technically, the majority, which uh, ruled that there was a, a Kansas right under the Kansas Constitution to abortion, uh, all those judges were all Johnson County judges, while all the judges that were outside of Johnson County uh, were among the dissenters, which I thought was interesting. I'm not sure why that ended up being that way, but I just thought it was sort of interesting. Um, and so with that background, uh, just how the, there, uh, there are a lot of things I'd love to be able to tell you about the inside machinations, which I, I really can't, but I can say that there were some hard feelings on when the court made the decision to hear this case en banc. That was controversial within our court. Uh, I don't think I'm talking out of school to say that. That uh, also required a, a significant debate within our court and our conference just to make that decision. And that ended up, you know, was a, was a momentous decision, I think, for our court. And there were a few judges who I still think today probably harbor some uh, unhappiness about that because, you know, on a, on a controversial decision like this, you're going to always make 
somebody unhappy or somebody very upset with such a controversial issue. And I think there were some judges who didn't want to have to declare which side of that fence they were going to be on. Uh, so I think it's significant uh, from that standpoint. But the good news also, I think, uh, in this case is to, to show how the Court of Appeals, I, I, I guess I'm proud of our court and that we took such an important issue and such a big case and decided it in a very expeditious manner. We, uh, when the case was brought to us, we set it for oral argument in a relatively short period of time, I think only a couple months. Uh, we heard the case in uh, December of 15, I think it was. Uh, and we issued an opinion in January of 16. So the opinion came out really within 60 days of our hearing the case, which I think is pretty significant for such an important case. Um, and I'm proud of our court uh, for having done that. We didn't keep, we recognized the importance of the case to the public. Uh, we recognized the importance of the case to the litigants. And because of that, I think we took it seriously for that reason, even though we understand that, in, particularly in a question like this, we're, we're a speed bump, in, in essence, to the, to the uh, end of justice, that ultimately the Kansas Supreme Court will have the final word. But we did do take our jobs very seriously and take our roles seriously. I, I think it's a credit to our court that we were able to handle it in the way we did. <clears throat> well, and I, I think it is fair to say that we were disappointed that the Kansas Supreme Court would not take a case when both sides asked that they take it. And I am also proud of, of everybody on the court, even those that uh, do not side with the, Judge Powell and I on this issue, with the fact that we took a stand. And we took a stand during an election year, uh, and you, you know you can run and hide from cases, or you can do your, I think the Code of Judicial Conduct, requires you to decide even the difficult cases. It would be nice to pick and choose, but we don't get the opportunity to do that. So just so you understand the process, as Judge Powell said, this was a temporary injunction to stop the act from going into effect on July 1st, 2015. Passed in the Kansas legislature in 2015. Immediately, these physicians filed and got a temporary injunction from Judge Larry Hendricks here in the Shawnee County District Court uh, in which he basically stayed it from going into effect. Now ultimately, because of the way the Court of Appeals was divided on this issue, the temporary injunction continues to this day to stay in effect. But I do, as I said before, believe this is a good example about different judicial philosophies. This was unique because actually most judges on our court sided with us. Six judges, which I'm calling the Federal Supremacy Group or the Liebig Group, uh, six judges, Perrin, McEnany, Boozer, Standridge, and uh, Arnold Berger joined an opinion written by uh, Judge Liebig. Judge Atchison, and I'm going to call him uh, the lone wolf or the living constitution uh, group, and uh, kind of like in, uh, what's the movie, uh, Hangover or, or whatever, that uh, he's kind of the lone wolf on his own on this issue. Uh, uh, and you'll see that, that he uses it very much a living constitution uh, philosophy, which of course we know is out there. And then seven judges, including uh, Judges Green, Hill, Judge Powell, myself, uh, Judge Schroeder, and Judge Garner uh, joined an opinion written by uh, then Chief Judge Tom Lowe. I think we both would have liked to have written this opinion, but uh, he was Chief Judge and he got to pay for wrote that uh, opinion, but he did a great job. And I would call this more of a textualist or an originalist. And kind of was, it, it was unique because not everybody necessarily had exactly the same view on it, but we did have the same view on the, the outcome. So some were basing it maybe more on original intent, some were basing it maybe more on, on just plain language of, of the Constitution. And uh, I just wanted to remind you, if you don't have it memorized, this was brought, as, as Judge Powell said, not under federal law at all. Even though the, the decision that ended up being prevailing is based on federal law, they wanted to avoid, I asked the question, I said, why aren't you in federal court? They wanted to 
They did not want this case removed to federal court, so they only brought the case under the Kansas Constitution. Section 1 of the Bill of Rights and Section 2. Section 1, however, is the most important. I'll remind you what it says. These words may sound real familiar. Quote, all men are possessed of equal and inalienable natural rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Anybody heard language like that someplace before? That comes, of course, from the Declaration of Independence. That's not found in the United States Constitution. As uh, Justice Stegall was talking about the, uh, the Wyandotte Constitution here in Kansas uh, was actually ratified in 1859. And of course, it became a state in 1861. There was no 14th Amendment ratified until nine years later. So it's very difficult to say that the Kansas Bill of Rights was based on the 14th Amendment when they would have had to have had a time machine in order to have done that. But here's the reasoning. I'm just going to quote a, a small section. Read the opinion if you're interested. Uh, I, I do think it's interesting uh, reading. Uh, Judge Lehman said this uh, for the what I'm calling the Lehman Six. Quote, the Kansas Supreme Court has said for nearly a century that sections one and two of the Kansas Constitution Bill of Rights have much the same effect as the due process and equal protection clauses of the United States Constitution. And, and a right to abortion has been recognized under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution for more than 40 years, citing Roe. We therefore conclude that sections one and two of the Kansas Constitution Bill of Rights provide the same protection for abortion rights as the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution the district court correctly determined the Kansas Constitution Bill of Rights provides a right to abortion. And in keeping with Justice Stegall's presentation uh, on Justice Brewer, Judge, Judge Lieben uh, uses Lochner in a way to show that Lochner provides substantive due process. Kansas version of Lochner is a case called Gilbert B. Matthews decided in 1960 which also says there's a such thing as substantive due process. Now there's debates out there whether there's truly really substantive due process or not, but regardless of that, Judge Lehman relied on Lochner and Matthews to say, hey, we recognize substantive due process. Section one of the Kansas Constitution provides substantive due process rights. And so that philosophy is very much based on let's yield to the interpretation of the, con the federal constitution and basically wrap that into the Kansas constitution. Judge Atchison's reasoning was a little different. He recognized, quote, that the language of section one had no direct or even generally analog analogous counterpart in the United States constitution. The provision therefore affords protections distinct from any in the United States constitution and should be construed independently of federal constitutional law. To that extent, he agreed with, with the Judge Malone and Judge Pal and I, but then he went on and said, however, he equated natural rights in the Kansas Constitution with self-determination or the exercise of free will. And based on that, he says, consistent with the drafter's overreaching vision for section one, women cannot now be permitted only a half measure of self-determination. Accordingly, women have a right protected in section one to exercise reproductive freedom as an essential component of their self-determination. The seven that uh, decided that the injunction uh, should be set aside uh, and found that the Kansas did not provide a specific right to abortion. Judge Malone's opinion, basically, here's a summary of what we concluded. Quote, simply put, there is nothing within the text or the history of sections one and two of the Kansas Constitution Bill of Rights to lead this court to conclude that these provisions were intended to guarantee a right to abortion. Kansas courts are authorized to interpret our state constitution in a manner different than the United States Constitution and has been construed and we should do so when appropriate. Our state's founders held sacred the basic concepts of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and they express those sentiments in, the order, in that order in section one of our Bill of Rights. Even if Kansas courts were to find substantive due process rights under section one, as opposed to a mere expression of traditional beliefs, we would not find a substantive due process right to abortion. 
So hopefully, uh, we'll find out what the uh, Kansas Supreme Court, this has been argued now, uh, and hopefully we'll soon find out what the Kansas Supreme Court will uh, say about this issue, but I uh, will remind you that, uh, I wish Justice Steele was here for this, just because the Supreme Court hears a case doesn't mean they're always right, but they are usually last. Judge Powell, you want to maybe uh, talk about a couple of criminal cases? Before uh, we decided how we were going to make our presentation, uh, I got the short end of the stick and uh, agreed to do the uh, criminal, do talk about through the criminal uh, law updates. Hopefully, it'll have some practical use for you. Uh, I think our, some of our more interesting cases were the civil cases, particularly the abortion case that we just talked about. But I wanted to pick out a few cases that I think are significant. Uh, the one case I want to talk about first is State versus Hardy, and that's on page 45 of your criminal materials. I think they're all stapled together, so go to the criminal section, and then it's number page, page 45 under criminal self-defense. Um, I think this case is significant because it deals in a significant way with the legislature's uh, self-defense immunity statute. Uh, in recent years, uh, I think the issue of self-defense and the right to self-defense, particularly as it pertains to the right in, to keep and bear arms, I think is gaining and growing support among our public. Uh, particularly when you see the terrorist attacks that have occurred around the world and even here in the United States and the fact that law enforcement, you know, they can't be there instantly. They can't be everywhere. And uh, we learned that just uh, this past week you know, with the shooting of a congressman that if that uh, congressman Scalise, who's a member of the House leadership, uh, did not have uh, his security detail there, we could have had a massacre on our hands. And so I think you know, there are views in many legislatures, particularly in our legislature, that the right to self-defense is a very important right. And I think the legislature has expressed itself significantly by uh, elevating that right really beyond what is traditionally known uh, as an affirmative defense to a criminal charge. And the right of self-defense in the past has always really been treated as an affirmative defense. They've raised it now really to a level of immunity. And uh, how our courts have dealt with that, I think we've we struggled. And in this case, I think the, the Supreme Court, uh, in an opinion uh, authored by Justice Stegall, uh, I think does a good job in really setting forth the clear rules as to how we should look at it. Um, the statutes under KSA 21-5231, uh, and it provides immunity for persons who act in lawful self-defense. It says, basically, that a person who uses force, which is justified, is immune from criminal prosecution and a civil action for the use of such force unless the person against whom force is abused was law enforcement. Uh, so by shorthand, uh, you have, a, have immunity from prosecution if you use lawful self-defense unless you use uh, that force against law enforcement, and then the traditional rules of an affirmative of defense would apply. Uh, as you're all probably aware, typically, uh, before a, a defendant can be put on trial for a felony, there must be a preliminary hearing in which the state must put on sufficient evidence to establish that there's probable cause that the defendant committed the charged crime. The district court is to make this determination typically. Uh, of course, you can always use a, a grand jury to do that. But typically in our state, the more common practice is the use of a preliminary hearing where the judge, uh, after reviewing the facts presented by the state in the light most favorable to the state, uh, uh, without doing any real weighing, uh, makes the decision whether probable cause to exist that that defendant committed the charge crime. Uh, it's all done in the backdrop of the fact that the defendant is ultimately entitled to have a jury decide his guilt or innocence based upon the requirement that the state then has to prove that guilt uh, in each element of the, the offense beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Hardy was riding as a, at a, in a, as a passenger in a car driven by Jalen Bradley. 
and they were driving to some gathering uh, uh, to a house uh, on Fairview Street in Wichita. Uh, Javier Flores was a party goer at the house in which uh, the defendant party and I presume it was his girlfriend, uh, Jalen Bradley drove to, uh, was apparently severely intoxicated and when Hardy and Bradley attempted to leave with uh, a minor whose initials are YM, uh, some dispute arose. And Flores and several others attempted to block the car from leaving the house. In fact, they surrounded uh, the car. Uh, Flores then shelled, uh, yelled racial slurs to both Hardy and Bradley. And in fact, several bystanders tried to hold Flores back because he had become uh, so agitated. Uh, the facts don't dispute that Flores was the real instigator of the violence. Uh, Flores approached the, the passenger side of the car and he reached in and struck Hardy two or three times in the face. This uh, prompted Hardy then to pick up Bradley's gun. Now, I, I don't know why Bradley had a gun with her, but she did. And, uh, takes it out of the car's console, and uh, he shoots uh, Flores. Uh, then uh, Bradley picks up the gun, and she shoots Flores as well. Now, amazingly, Flores wasn't killed, but he was hit in his extremities, and the state uh, charged uh, Hardy with aggravated battery. Uh, judge Kaufman, who's an excellent district judge in Central County, heard this case. And he first heard the evidence uh, at the preliminary hearing, and he decided the matter strictly as a traditional uh, preliminary hearing you would. He made the, the determination as to whether the state had presented sufficient evidence uh, uh, in the light most favorable to the state, whether it was probable cause that the party committed the crime of an aggravated battery. And he bound over the defendant uh, on that basis. Um, Subsequent to the preliminary hearing, Hardy then files a motion for immunity, uh, claiming that his use of force was justified and that he was entitled to immunity. And he was really arguing, Judge, I should be immune from this. I should be subject to a trial. Uh, Judge Kaufman, there was also a dispute. Well, was he entitled to a separate uh, additional evidentiary hearing on this point? What, how is the court to view this evidence? Do they view the evidence in the light most favorable to the state? Or do they just do a normal weighing of the evidence? And we really had no precedent uh, for how to deal with that particular question. Uh, Judge Kaufman, relying in part on a Kentucky Supreme Court decision, which has a very similar statute, ruled that the court wasn't required to take additional evidence but could take the record as it was, meaning the preliminary hearing record, plus any affidavits, uh, probable cause affidavits, uh, to decide this question. But Judge Kaufman ruled that he would not look at the evidence of the light most favorable to the state, but would simply do a normal weighing. And after having done so, uh, Judge Kaufman said Hardy was entitled to immunity and basically declared uh, basically dis dismissed the charge. The court, the, the, the case, of course, the state appealed to our court, and uh, Judge Atchison, in a case, uh, reversed the district court, and I think really uh, looked at this case in terms of how do we apply the preliminary hearing framework. Uh, I think uh, the, the panel that heard this case really looked at it in terms of that, that uh, we should deal with this as part of a preliminary hearing, that the evidence should be viewed in the light most favorable to the state, that the finding of there should be a finding of probable cause, but that finding also should be a negative finding, that, that the state has to show probable cause, that the defendant's use of force was not justified, and it should all, in essence, be at the, done at the same time. And so uh, the court reversed and said that the hearing should be conducted at the same time as a preliminary hearing. Uh, ultimately, the case came to the Supreme Court, and what I think is significant is that the court talks about, as it does often, about the plain language of the statute. 
and it drew a clear distinction that the legislature was drawing a clear distinction between simply using it as an affirmative defense, which self-defense had always traditionally been viewed at, with the words of the statute which talks about immunity, that it, the legislature clearly meant something more, that with immunity, the court talked about this really entitles a person to not be subject to a trial. Uh, and so that, it had to be more than just, a, in essence, a negative finding. Uh, referring uh, to the definition of immunity, the court refu uh, refers to Black's Law Dictionary, which defines immunity as any exemption from a duty, liability, or service process. It concluded that the whole purpose of the, of the immunity statute was designed to avoid a trial, and it reasoned that while courts, uh, the lower courts that had considered this case were typically reluctant, which is understandable when you're used to looking at issues in a certain way, usually when we look at these cases, we think of it in terms of the defendant's rights and the state's right to have a jury determine the guilt or innocence of the defendant. And there's a reluctance to sort of take that away. And that's how it's traditionally looked at. But I think the court uh, said, no, uh, we have to look at this particular question differently. The, the court drew an analogy when the court, uh, a neutral and detached magistrate determines whether there's probable cause to support a search warrant. And that when a court does that, it typically does a weighing of the evidence. It doesn't look at those facts necessarily in the light most favorable to the state, but looks at those facts as they come to the court to make a decision whether there is in fact probable cause to conduct that search. So ultimately the court concluded that uh, in considering cases under immunity, the court uh, directed that district courts when reviewing this issue, they they are to look at the evidence uh, by weighing that evidence, not viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the state. And they're to conduct an evidentiary hearing, but the court gave discretion to the district courts as to what, when that uh, hearing should be conducted. It doesn't have to be conducted in conjunction uh, with the preliminary hearing, though that might be a time saver, but the court didn't mandate that. It's really left at the discretion of the district court. But says the district court may weigh that evidence, and if the court finds that the defendant's use of force is justified, they're entitled to immunity, and there is no trial. Uh, <clears throat> Josh, I don't, Josh, I don't recall what time we ended up starting with. When do you want to stand by? We want to make sure we end up yeah. here. About 10, 10, 15 more minutes. Okay. Well, I think in the interest of time, what we'll do is uh, we'll just point out, highlight a few cases and not get into detail. And then we wanted to at least leave it open for a couple questions at the end. Uh, so on page 16 of your civil outline, uh, there's a case called Smart versus uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe well, Railway Company. Now, a lot of you probably do not do uh, federal employer Employers Liability Act FILA cases. However, this opinion I think is one that you, uh, if you if you practice in state courts and have not practiced much lately in federal courts, this is a case uh, that you want to review. It was an opinion written by uh, Judge Garner, who of course was for many years a research attorney for uh, Judge Sam Crow in federal court, and she writes about the application of doubt. And I think that's very important because uh, some of you, uh, you know, I went on the trucker bench in 1999 and uh, all we knew was fry, except when every once in a while we go over to federal court. So I'm not going to read that case to you or point out anything other than if you want a good case on the application of Daubert and the district court's role as the gatekeeper on an expert witness, Judge Gardner's opinion, I think, is excellent on that. And a mandate was issued on April 20th, uh, 2016, so certainly you can cite that case. Another one on page 16 of the outline that I want to point out uh, is a Kansas Supreme Court uh, opinion in the case of Abadaka versus Wilmore. And uh, that case is uh, somewhat, uh, well, it's interesting for a lot of reasons that I can't, I probably won't get into. But one thing is it's a four to three opinion. 
uh, from the Supreme Court. I actually had the uh, case in the Court of Appeals. The issue which came out of Shawnee County, Larry Hendricks again, uh, and I, I know I irritate some of my uh, fellow judges in the Court of Appeals, but Shawnee County is kind of the D.C. Circuit of Kansas. A lot of these state-type cases come through Shawnee County. That's why you'll see, and people ask me, why do you see Judge Hamper's name on all these cases, or Judge Tice, or whoever? It's because so many cases from the AG, or whoever, come through Shawnee County. But this one also came, this had to do with a, uh, whether or not the firefighters rule should be extended to law enforcement officers. Now, the firefighters rule you may or may not be familiar with, but it's a rule that basically says that if a firefighter is responding to a fire or an accident or something, they cannot sue the person who basically caused whatever it was that they're responding to. And uh, Judge Hendricks, a lot of courts around the country, and, and uh, the panel I was on, we all said yes, it should be expanded to law enforcement because it really wouldn't be uh, fair or just and you know what. To, uh, to say that a firefighter and a police officer responding to the same accident, one could sue that person, the other couldn't. And so we said, yes, it should be extended to law enforcement officers. Uh, four of the uh, justices is agreed with that. But the other thing I find interesting is uh, politics makes strange bed bedfellows, but so does, uh, does the law because uh, the dissenters in that case were uh, Justice Lee Johnson, who was joined by Justice Dan Biles, and then a separate dissenting opinion was uh, uh, written by our uh, friend and colleague in the back of the room, Justice Caleb Stiegel. Now, I would say that uh, this was an issue not presented to the Court of Appeals, but I think Justice Johnson and Justice Stiegel both bring up a good point, and that is, should the firefighters rule have ever been adopted in the first place? Is this common law or is this public policy? And if it's public policy, shouldn't this be left to the legislature? So I would offer, and that's very simplistic, I would, I would offer that for your consideration. Uh, do any of you do work comp? Nobody does? Okay, we won't talk about that case. Two cases that came out since the uh, outline that I do want to point out to you is, uh, first of all, the case of Lozano versus Alvarez, which is uh, 394 P. 3rd, 862, decided on May 26th. Uh, it's a civil procedure case for those of you who do civil litigation. It involves an interpretation of the st savings statute, and it makes it very clear that you can uh, get additional time if your original action was commenced during the statute of limitations and it was dismissed for a reason other than the merits. It also makes it very clear the age-old question uh, that district court judges at least wanted to know what the answer was, that basically you cannot get more than one bite at the app. It's a, again, that's a simplistic explanation, but if you do civil litigation, that's a case you want to look at. The other reason I wanted to point that out is it's one of the uh, few opinions sometimes that I agree with Justice Johnson on, so I, I want to point out that I agree with him on that particular one. Uh, and then the other one that came out after the outline that uh, anybody do product liability? Well, you probably don't care much about this then, but if you ever have the economic loss doctrine, you might want to look at the uh, Corvius Military versus Ventomatic involving bathroom fans and the economic loss doctrine uh, and integrated parts and how far the economic loss doctrine should be extended. And that case is, uh, I don't have the piece third site, but it's uh, 2017 Westlaw 2403041. Since we're running short of time, let me just talk about two more uh, criminal cases uh, from the Supreme Court that I think uh, are of significance over the past year or so. Uh, the first is uh, State versus Sherman. That's on page 38 uh, under prosecutorial misconduct. This case I think is significant because I think it finally writes the law with regard to this terminology, the use of what used to be called prosecutorial misconduct. Now, as that name suggests, when we think of misconduct, we sort of think of some nefarious or ill will, improper conduct on the part of a prosecutor when in the vast majority of these cases, what we're really dealing with 
is what would be called prosecutorial error, some misstatements or uh, incorrect statements made by prosecutors during the course of a trial, typically in a closing argument, uh, that may have some impact on the trial, but the, the Supreme Court and the, in the decision sort of talks about the history and how it developed, uh, and it really stems from the importance of the right to have a fair trial. You have a due process right to a fair trial, and the prosecutor as an agent of the state, but also as an officer of the court, of course has that duty to aggressively prosecute the case, but not to cross the line and to, in essence, impair or endanger the defendant's right to a fair trial. We'll talk, talking about how certain prosecutorial tactics or statements uh, can have the effect of doing that and discusses sort of how the history uh, of the law in this area uh, came about. Uh, the the, the uh, previous test was uh, really uh, created in the sense of prosecutors are given wide latitude uh, to present their case, but in those instances where they stray beyond that wide latitude, uh, then the court has to look at, well, was in that particular instance, whether it be a comment or some other act of the prosecutor that was outside their wide latitude, did it have an impact uh, on the trial? Did it prejudice the defendant? And the state has the burden to show uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that the comment uh, didn't uh, undermine the, the verdict. And then there's a sort of an additional test that sort of involved the, the misconduct uh, part of that equation. I think the, the problem that the, we were running into is, that, as I mentioned, that in most of these cases, we're not dealing with, with misconduct. And the, the problem that the Supreme Court talks about in this case, and again, it's another opinion uh, written by Justice Stiegel, is that it works in unfairness in two different ways. One, it un in many instances can mischaracterized the prosecutor's action, that it was really simply error, there wasn't ill will or any improper motive behind the comment and sort of branding a prosecutor's actions as misconduct, but in fact, it's not really misconduct, it's really just simple error. And then the converse as well, in cases where there might be uh, actual misconduct on the part of a prosecutor, uh, but if that misconduct ultimately didn't affect the verdict, then a prosecutor's misconduct, in essence, can go unpunished. And so that is also the problem with sort of trying to have one test, as the Supreme Court described. And so what the Supreme Court did, I think, correctly is to say, you know what, we're going to split this up, and we're going to say, okay, in general, what we have is prosecutorial error, and you're going to basically use the same test that we've talked about in the past. One, you analyze the comments as to whether uh, are they beyond the wide latitude that are afforded prosecutors in making uh, their case and the statements they make uh, to the jury? Uh, and if so, uh, did, that, uh, mis did that error, uh, either the wrong act or wrong statements, affect the outcome and deny the defendant a fair trial? Uh, so that's normal prosecutorial error, and that's how we're to, in the bulk of these cases now to look at those cases. And I think those of us certainly who review these cases frequently, I think are relieved to have to, to be able to say we don't have to use that word uh, misconduct uh, in, in every case. I think a number of us on the Court of Appeals didn't like using that term because of the sort of pejorative uh, thoughts that come along with that. But what's interesting is that the court took the next step and said, with regard to, just got a couple minutes left, with regard to the misconduct, we're not going to let the prosecutor off the hook so easily. We may not uh, the court said we're not going to use our supervisory role of crim over criminal prosecutions necessarily to uh, absolve the defendant of guilt, but we will pro punish that prosecutor, and that prosecutor can still be punished either through a disciplinary proceeding or the court using its contempt powers to punish uh, a, a, a wayward prosecutor in particular instances. And so uh, I think this clarification of the law is a useful one, and uh, that's a significant case. The last case I want to talk about is State versus Peterson Beard. This is also interesting because uh, I, I'm not sure it's ever happened before, but it's where the Supreme Court uh, dealt with the issue of whether uh, post release, not, not post, but offender registration is punishment. Involved lifetime registration, 
this, the, the Supreme Court heard three cases in September 14 before Justice Stegall joined the court and then heard Peterson Beard uh, a year later in September of 15. And what's interesting is that the court came down four to three uh, ruling that post-release, uh, I keep wanting to say post-release, but offender registration was in fact punishment. Uh, and then when Justice Stegall joined the court, they went four three the other way to say, no, offender registration is not punishment. And so, in essence, the court in Peterson Beard, which uh, Justice Stegall authored, they issued all four opinions on the same day, yet Peterson Beard overruled uh, three other Supreme Court, the three other cases decided on the same day. Uh, I'm not sure that's ever happened before. I think it got some national attention because of it. But the Supreme Court, I think, what affirmed what had, has been the traditional view of offender registration, that it's not punishment, and so uh, challenges such as ex post facto challenges or cruel and unusual punishment challenges. And more recently, the Supreme Court de dealt with the issue in the case of an Apprendi uh, analysis. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Apprendi, Apprendi is the rule that any fact which is used to increase your sentence beyond the statutory maximum must be proven to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. In a very recent case, I think it just came out last week, the Supreme Court said it doesn't matter whether the court makes a factual finding in order to subject you to lifetime post-release supervision because post-release, not post see I keep saying it again, offender registration is not punishment, so there's no constitutional violation there. Uh, I commend those cases to you. Uh, I'm not sure if we've got any time left, but we'd be happy to answer any yeah, thank you. No questions. Well, we have time to us, sir. Yeah, we can do questions informally uh, during the break, so we can. Hey, have if anybody, I would remind you, if you didn't know, that this is the 40th anniversary of the Kansas Court of Appeals. Uh, the new Kansas Court of Appeals. We well, had one back in the 1800s, and then this one started again in 1977. Uh, so, if you have any questions, we can't get any in anything that's pending before the court, as you know. Any questions about procedure cases, anything like that, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you.